I've been wanting to build myself a brand new RetroPie based off the Raspberry Pi 4, but I want it to be an SSD boot system. Number one, for stability, and number two, because I have a totally legitimate ROM library. There are a couple different ways you could do this. Number one, you could have a cable nightmare like this with a pretty good looking case, but your SSD is left just kind of hanging outside. You could also get yourself an acrylic case like this with an SSD board mounted to the bottom, but this really doesn't pass the living room looks test for me either. Thankfully, just when I was ready to compromise with one of these solutions, Retroflag reached out and asked if I wanted to review their brand new case, which not only has an SSD mount, it's one of the best looking Raspberry Pi cases I've seen yet. Welcome back to Craft Computing, everyone. As always, I'm Jeff. And like I said, today we're gonna to take a look at the Retroflag NES Pi 4 case with a functional NES cartridge that serves as an SSD caddy. Now I've built RetroPies in cases like this before, and spoiler alert, I've already unboxed this once. But honestly, this is one of the best looking and best quality ones that I've ever seen. You've got that trademark NES flip up door with a removable two and a half inch SSD caddy inside of an NES cartridge. There's a functional power and reset button on this and the power button is captive. Your console ports have been replaced with USB ports. One of them a USB 2.0, the other a 3.0. I did notice that they're of different orientations though. So if you already are a person who struggles plugging a USB in on the first time, uh, you're gonna hate this front layout. Flipping around to the side of the case, we have our micro SD card slot accessible from the outside, which is always a nice touch on a Raspberry Pi case. Moving around to the rear, we have our two mini DisplayPort outputs, as well as three and a half millimeter audio. We've also got the USB-C power in and our RJ45 ethernet. Now these two ports are redirected on the inside via a couple pigtails. So the only cables you're gonna see from the front of the console are those controller ports. Like I said, no detail has been missed from the NES and that includes the bottom of the console. So the expansion port on this NES has been converted into a micro SD storage box, which I think is a very clever idea. So overall, a very simple case with a very recognizable look. But let's see if we can get this Raspberry Pi 4 torn down, get it into the NES case, and see if we can get rid of some of that cable clutter as well as hide our SSD. First off, let's get this Raspberry Pi 4 out of this very nice blue metal case that I've got and into the NES Pi 4. Now, this thing just cracks open. It doesn't come screwed together from the factory, which is kind of nice. And inside of here, we can see we've got our screws, a couple of thermal pads, and a pretty decent little aluminum heatsink. Also a note, please remove the SD card before installing the Raspberry Pi. Well, that's helpful because I'm not going to use one. All right, we're gonna start out by putting our thermal pads onto the Raspberry Pi. Oh, in focus like that. Next up, the Raspberry Pi only goes in this one way. So we're gonna plug in our couple of USB cables here. Followed by our ethernet pigtail. There we go. And that should drop right into place. Next up, we have this little pigtail right here, which provides power to the Raspberry Pi, as well as delivering the safe shutdown script that we'll install a little bit later. And as you can see, this is directional. So this end of the cable goes towards the outside of the Raspberry Pi. Just like that. Next up, we're gonna get the fan installed, which slots right on top of the Pi, just like that. And they hold down with these two longer black screws that are included. Next up is to plug in the USB pigtail from the upper section of the case, and this is actually what plugs in the SSD to the Raspberry Pi. And if everything looks good, you are ready to close it up. Flip it over to the underside, and there are six screw holes to put these nice long screws into. And there we go, ready for the last part, which is installing the SSD into this sweet little cartridge. So one limitation I did notice when I was setting up for this video was you do need to be careful of the SSD that you select. So for me, I'm gonna use this 120 gig SSD from Kingston. However, originally I was gonna use this 256 gigabyte from Crucial, which is an old one that I had laying around. However, this is a nine millimeter thick drive. The Kingston is a seven millimeter thick drive. The nine millimeter will not fit inside of this cartridge. It is just a little bit too thick. As you can see, the cartridge won't quite close. So keep that in mind for whatever drive you plan on putting into this SSD sled, you need a seven millimeter thick drive at the very most. 
Once you have the drive snapped into place, there are four screws that go into this chassis. There's these two ones for the SSD itself. And then these two smaller screws, which go into the cartridge itself to hold it closed. And there you go. One of the coolest NES cartridges I've ever seen. And in theory, that should slide right into the front of the NES. Oh, that feels just like an original. Oh, that is so cool. Yes. I love it. By default, the Raspberry Pi 4 will not be able to boot from a USB disk and requires a firmware update to do so. So we're gonna update the firmware on this Raspberry Pi. First up, open up a terminal and go to sudo apt update and let it grab the latest packages. Next, type in sudo apt full dash upgrade and this will download the latest firmware. Be patient because this process takes a little while. In my case, it was nearly 22 minutes to download the full upgrade. Once the download and upgrade have completed, you actually need to apply the new firmware. So we're gonna type in sudo rpi-eeprom-update-d-a. This should display the current version of firmware you have installed on your Raspberry Pi, as well as the latest version you're going to be upgrading to. If everything looks good, go ahead and reboot. When the system is back up, go back into the terminal and type in sudo raspi-config to bring up the Raspberry Pi configurator. Go down to boot options, scroll down to boot order, and select USB boot. This will allow the Pi to boot from a USB device if there's no SD card present, or if the SD card does not contain a Pi image. Next, go back to Boot Options and select Boot ROM version. Now, set the Pi to use the latest version of Boot ROM software. Next, go ahead and shut down your Pi, and your Pi should be ready to boot from USB. I'm going to be using RetroPie on my, well, RetroPie, but unfortunately, the current RetroPie image is not able to boot off USB on a Raspberry Pi 4. So we're going to have to install Raspi OS and then install RetroPie onto that. To set up Raspi OS onto the SSD, we're gonna use the exact same method we would to image an SD card. That is connect the SATA SSD to your PC using a USB to SATA adapter, and then image it using your favorite tool. Now there's only a couple steps left. First off, we're gonna boot up the Raspberry Pi using our newly imaged SSD and install the safe shutdown script. So both the power and reset button will work on the NES Pi 4 case. Installing the script is very simple and just requires a wget command you can copy from the Retroflag website. Finally, we're gonna download the the Git repository for the RetroPie installation, and then run RetroPie setup. This process again takes a little while, so it's a great opportunity to go grab some lunch, and I'll see you after the break. So after a quick lunch break while RetroPie installed onto Raspi OS, what do I think of this system as a whole now? Honestly, I love the NES Pi 4 case. This is a fantastic bit of kit that not only adds a ton of functionality to the Raspberry Pi, it does so with a good sturdy case and quite a bit of flair. Price-wise, it is on the upper end of what you would normally spend on a Raspberry Pi, if the case was the only thing you were buying. But we'll get into the whole package here in just a second. Now, I started off this video mentioning a couple other solutions that I was looking at to get an SSD mounted into my Raspberry Pi, but the obvious contender is the GeekPi X825. In this package right here, the X825 has pretty much the same functionality as the NES Pi case. It has a momentary power button with a safe shutdown script you can run on the Raspberry Pi, as well as the addition of a two and a half inch SSD you can mount inside the case itself. Now the XA25 does come with a cooling fan, but it's not directly over the Raspberry Pi and just provides a slight amount of airflow through the case. And in fact, it didn't even come with the heat sinks that I installed inside of here. These were added extra outside of the cost of the XA25. So what kind of price are we looking at for this functionality? Well, the X825 actually comes in three pieces. Number one is the PCB itself, which is the SSD mount, and that runs about $33 on Amazon. The case is custom acrylic, and that is on Amazon as well for about $17, but this also doesn't come with a power adapter, which is a five volt barrel jack. That's gonna run you an extra $10. So we're looking, if my math is anywhere correct, about $59 all in for this package. Now let's compare that to the NES Pi 4 case from Retroflag. Not only is the case subjectively a lot better looking, it's also objectively a lot sturdier than the acrylic case that comes with the X825. Included in this box, you get the two and a half inch SSD to USB adapter, you get a USB-C power cable to power the whole thing up, and you get that aluminum heatsink and fan combo that goes on top of the Raspberry Pi, allowing for a little bit better overclocking. That entire package is $40, which is $20 less than the $60 X825. Now I do have a couple small gripes about the NES Pi. It's not perfect, but it's darn close. Number one, I wish the USB ports on the front of it were facing the same direction. It would make it a lot easier to plug cables in blindly if you knew which direction they're supposed to be. 
Now I haven't heard back on whether or not these cartridges will be available for sale individually, but if they are, I would absolutely love to have two or three or four of them laying around. That way, if I wanted to test a different operating system, or let's say have RetroPie on one, Ubuntu on another, and Raspi on a third, I can just swap them in and out from the same Raspberry Pi without having to take a whole system apart. One other thing Retroflag sent over for review is this brand new Gully Kit Elves Pro controller. And if you're at all familiar with the 8-bit Doe controllers, this is all the same company. One thing I do like is it comes in this nice protective case. So if you wanted to toss it in a backpack, you're uh, protected on the go. Uh, it is available in a lot of different colors, although all of them are kind of this pastel-y color. So if you like the, the coral or the blue, this is definitely for you. If you're not familiar with this line of controllers, it works on pretty much anything over USB or over Bluetooth wireless. And you can hook it up to a Windows PC or a Linux PC or a Mac PC or Android, iOS, uh, Nintendo Switch, Xbox 360. It, works on pretty much any system you want to plug it into. Given that the same company makes both controllers, I am going to be comparing this directly to the 8-bit Doe Pro controller. And that being stated, uh, my least favorite feature on this Elves Pro controller has got to be the joysticks. Um, they don't have quite the range of motion as the 8-bit Doe Pro controller does, and I found it really limiting in games, especially when I was trying for some more fine input. My wife also tried her hand at playing this though, and she really liked this controller, but she has much smaller hands than I do. Uh, so it is gonna be a little bit of personal preference there. To me, these did not feel like the greatest quality joysticks, but my wife did like them. Overall, the Elves Pro Controller feels just slightly less expensive, slightly less premium, a little bit more plasticky compared to the 8-bit Doe Pro Controller. Uh, the buttons are a little bit spongier, especially the D-pad. There's really no tactile feedback in the D-pad at all, and you really don't know what direction you're pushing unless you're looking at the screen and you see your guy moving left or right. Probably the best aspect of the Els Pro controller is the left and right shoulder buttons. They feel just as clicky and responsive as they are on the 8-bit Doe controller. However, a glaring omission from this controller has got to be the left and right analog triggers. They are not analog, they're just momentary press buttons. And they are some of the spongiest trigger buttons I have ever pressed in my life. One nice addition to this controller is the dedicated switch buttons on the face of it, making it a little bit easier to use on the Nintendo Switch. However, I don't see this being a primary controller for the Nintendo Switch. To me, this feels more like the second controller you'd give your little brother instead of the controller that you only use for yourself. Overall, it's not bad. It's definitely not as good or as well made as the 8-bit Doe Pro controller, and there are still some glaring drawbacks, like the lack of analog and the subpar joysticks. However, this still is just an early production run of the Gully Kit Elves Pro controller, and they are looking for feedback. So I am hoping some improvements can be made in the future. In particular, if the joysticks were a little bit better and I would like a more responsive, more tactile D-pad, I think that would be a fantastic addition to this controller and make it a great system for the Switch. So wrapping up the Retroflag NES Pi 4 case, I am thrilled with this system. I love this case and I, I can't overstate how much I love it. It's about as close to perfect as you can get in a Raspberry Pi case for quite honestly, one of the better values in a Raspberry Pi ecosystem. And not just as a retro Pi case, although it is fantastic for that and would look great in your living room, but even as a general purpose Raspberry Pi case, this thing is near perfect. You have access to your USB ports on the front of the system itself. You have dedicated on and reset buttons, as well as a safe shutdown script to use on the Raspberry Pi, making powering it on and off just a little bit easier. It comes with the SSD to USB adapter, plus one of the cartridges, and I do hope they sell more of those cartridges later. It redirects all the extra cables to the rear of the Raspberry Pi, meaning that if you're setting this on a desk or in a living room, you don't have any cables coming out at weird angles from the side. Everything goes back to the back and stays very clean. The included heatsink and fan, while audible, are still fairly quiet and do allow this Raspberry Pi to overclock pretty much to the extent of what it can do. And on top of that, you get the power adapter included in the box as well, all for just $40, making it pretty much one of the best Raspberry Pi combo deals that's out there. But what do you guys think? Is the NES Pi priced appropriately or is there a better deal that I'm not looking at? Let me know down in the comments below. On your way down there, make sure to drop this video a like and subscribe to Craft Computing if you haven't done so already. Follow me on Twitter at Craft Computing to keep up with my daily shenanigans. And if you'd like the content you see on this channel and wanna help support me in what I do, consider joining the Patreon. Link is also down in the video description. A minimum contribution of $1 per month gets you access to my exclusive Discord server, where you can chat with myself and the other hosts from Talking Heads. Oh, and as of next week, you can catch me on Floatplane. Thank you all so much for watching this one, and as always, I will see you in the next video. Cheers, guys.